Thank you for joining us for a virtual book launch, a memoir, Melvin Mencher, From Coast to Coast and Stops in Between. Today's interview will be conducted by Rex Smith, chair of the Columbia Journalism Alumni Board and former editor of the Albany Times Union. And now we hand it over to Rex Smith. Good evening from Manhattan. It's a rainy night in New York, but it's a, a place with spirits high here at 450 Riverside Drive at the home of Mel Mencher, because we're here to honor uh, this teacher, mentor, inspiration for a generation of journalists. Most of you watching tonight or watching this at a later time know Mel Mencher. He has perhaps been your teacher. You know that he has been the, uh, was a distinguished professor of journalism at Columbia University uh, from 1962 to 1990. You know that he was the author of the most widely used journalism textbook of its time uh, that taught a quarter million students at 350 colleges and universities the craft of journalism. And you know that he was an inspiration for many. But now Mel has written a memoir uh, from coast to coast and stops in between. You'll see it right here. And we'll give you some uh, advice on how to order it if you haven't already at a couple of times this evening. So uh, we want to get together tonight to talk to you about some of the things that Mel talked about in the memoir and to sort of carry on a little bit further. Uh, we'd love to have been able to get together, but the realities of the pandemic are such that we can't have a full reception honoring Mel. So a few of us are here uh, tonight. And while Mel is quite fit, as you can see, he is 94 years old and we don't want him out running around in the rain and uh, in danger. Decrepit. De yeah, decrepit. <laughs> I might melt. <laughs> so we'll offer a toast later on behalf of all of you who are here. Um, so with the great support of uh, the irrepressible Renee Edelman, my classmate, uh, with the uh, talents of uh, DigiMentors, the company founded by Sri Srinivasan, uh, the creative genius who used to be a journalism professor. We're able to bring this to you tonight. If, by the way, you're watching live on social media, please don't hesitate to share this and to offer your comments as well. Uh, we'll be sure that those are posted. And so we're just going to have a conversation with Mel. We'll show you some of the video tributes that some of you have sent. We'll read some of them. There's not enough time for all of them, of course. But Mel will have access to all of those after this program is done. So how are you I'm, feeling? I'm feeling my age, unfortunately. As you can hear, I'm close to croaking. <laughs> well, literally, not figuratively, we hope. You know? <laughs> well, there are two meanings. Okay. <laughs> okay, well. I'll take the frog. Yeah, that's good. Keep the frog. So, well, to that effect, you know, you were a depression baby, uh, which um, yeah. is, is kind of amazing. Born two years before the stock market crash of 1929. And uh, your book makes it clear that you got by with very little uh, financial support. Well, we all support. did, yes, yeah. yes. I was, uh, I, I, I guess, suppose I, I, I think I'm blotting out most of that period because it was so unpleasant. Well, do you think we that that affected pay, pay your journalism? I mean, it was embarrassing. You'd come home from school and all of your furniture was on the street because you couldn't pay the rent. Oh. And uh, it, was, it was a difficult childhood. But as I look back, I think I must have been blessed with a, an ability to, to weather storms because uh, somehow I got through all that somewhat unscarred, except for the scar over here mm. when I was four years old riding a tricycle <laughs> and I hit the pedal and the handlebar came up. And it's interesting because in those days, you only went to a doctor if you were near death. Right. <laughs> you were fine, you were healed, so you fine. We put on a poultice of some kind and my mother squeezed it together. Right. And, yeah, it seems but, to have not left you too damaged. Yeah, so no. what I wonder is how you emerge from that. You know, your, your yearbook photo carries a <clears> caption <throat> that uses the word philosopher, which suggests uh, that you were a, a, a smart guy even then, you know, and I wonder, uh, and you became an honored professor at an Ivy League school. So I don't know how else to ask this except to say, were you always smarter than the other kids? No, uh, I don't think, I, I think I was the product of a remarkable period in New York City education where we had absolutely demanding 
teachers. And I have in somewhere in this large apartment an essay I wrote in the third grade, and it reads well. I mean, as a subject, a verb, and an object, the sentences, huh. and it tracks the little thing. So I think I'm a product, and we all were, of a demanding grade school and high school education. I went to D. Wood Clinton, famous high school at Patty. Chayefsky and a lot of other mm -hmm. writers. It was called a writer's school because they made you write. And I took that concept to teaching when I left the business of so-called business of journalism, the profession, I should say. <laughs> uh, anyway, I made my students write because that's how I made, made it through hard times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, in one of the other character aspects that I think came through in your teaching, uh, you always told us to be counterphobic. Uh, <laughs> in fact, my class once gave you a T-shirt that said be counterphobic on the front and uh, uh, to do what we're afraid to do. Yeah. And I, I think of the young Mel Mencher taking off from the Bronx, uh, going out west, which seems to me required you to be counterphobic. <laughs> and I wonder how did you develop that? Was that a sense of adventure? That was. I really thing. wish I could <clears throat> plumb <clears throat> that depth, but I remember distinctly what happened, why I went west and stayed west. I was, uh, I had graduated from high school at an early age. I was 16. We had some wonderful system in New York where if <clears throat> you showed any ability, you were pushed. And so I had, <clears throat> I had nowhere to go because I uh, didn't come from my, my father and my mother were not college graduates, although my father wrote better than I ever have been able to write. Really? It was a product of a wonderful high school education, which New York provided its, the children of its immigrant, immigrant parents. Anyway... I had a note from my cousin, whom I had worked with in hotels as I was a page boy, mm -hmm. which means you uh, called out the names of people and you had a little silver tray and you, <laughs> you got a phone call and you gave them a telephone and shoved the tray in their gut and hoped for a quarter. A tip. <laughs> anyway, he wrote and he said, if you have nothing better to do, take my job here at the Zia Lodge. Now, you have to go back to 1943 to Albuquerque, New Mexico, which I don't think had a population of 50,000 then. And the Zia Lodge was a motel on the outskirts of Highway 66, famous 66, and there was nothing between the Zia and the mountains and the Zia and Knob Hill, four or five miles toward the city. He said, if you take my job, I can go into the ROTC and you can go to the University of New Mexico, which I'd never heard of, of course. <laughs> and he said, you'll get enough money to play the tuition, which as I recall was something like $500 a year or something. And so I got on a Greyhound bus, and I'll never forget the ticket. It was this long, because you stopped in Harrisburg or somewhere in Pennsylvania and made these stops all along. And three days later, wow. you know, it was a three-day bus. Did you bus pack uh, meals? Did you have food with you? No, I didn't. I had one little suitcase. Ah. <laughs> Amazing. And, well, it's hard. I mean, as it was in privation. I was perfectly happy. And so we ended up uh, being a um, night clerk at a motel on the outskirts. And for those interested, the, the cost of lodging, if you were single, was $3.06 and in tax. And if you had a companion, Two, it was four dollars and eight cents. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> yeah, 
I guess that's right. So you were there though for for a year at the University oh, yeah, of New Mexico, yeah. right? That's yeah. all that first stop in New Mexico, and went off to the University of Colorado, where you met Helen Chamberlain, who became Mrs. Mensher. Uh, you know, I have to say, she seems to have been a remarkable young woman. You know, a, a Marine Corps veteran uh, working on a master's in psychology at, at the University of Colorado, away from home in Des Moines. So I want to ask you to try to set aside humility here, Mel. What did she see in you? What do you think? I've you? often wondered. <laughs> I don't mean that insulting. I guess maybe she thought, here is this Midwestern Iowa girl, woman, sorry, who, who grew up in a very in, encapsulated community in uh, Iowa, I'm trying to, Independence, Iowa. And here comes this a, a young fellow, I think I was maybe 20, and at the, I guess I was 20, full of excitement and enthusiasm, because that's the way I was. I was, a, a, oh, I think somebody used to call people like that Cracker Jacks. Anyway, <laughs> I think I was, it was, a, it was, as the old saying, opposites attract, and I suppose that was the magnetism. She was different, I was different, but also we had some practical, <laughs> situ a practical situation. Uh, my a friend of mine, Ed McNulty and I, were desperate to find housing in the university community, which had a huge influx of veterans from the GI Bill and no housing. We found a place out of town that had a, converted chicken coop and we moved in <laughs> and in the house proper were three women veterans of the Marine Corps, Helen, Tess, and um, Tilly. And so we got to know them and Ed married Tess and Mel married Helen. Poor Tilly. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, my, to the third. I mean, that's how they, in those days, I must say, after looking at the, the Times wedding announcements where they were, they'd been living together for four years and they get married. Well, in those days, you, you did not cohabitate. You did not live together. You got married. And so we, Ellen and I, uh, we graduated after a, a while and we just fell into it because I liked her and why she liked me, I don't know. And you said that you started to study journalism in part because you read that, that during the depression, there were two fields that didn't lose their jobs, journalists and uh, dentistry. Dentists. And dentistry. I didn't want to sit on, in a chair and, and watch people <laughs> go through the agony of having a tooth extracted. Uh -huh. So I, I chose journalism because I could write. I was trained in the New York City school system to write essays or themes. And I figured, well, that's a quick way to get a degree and go to work. And I was, a, as you pointed out, a depression born. I, I value the, uh, the degree as a channel toward employment. And I, it's hard to say this, but I probably am the only fully tenured professor, now emeritus at Columbia, who has only a bachelor's degree. Yeah, I did not have the wherewithal to go to a master's and a PhD. But I must tip my hat to uh, Dean Ed Barrett, a remarkable, I, he hired me and he knew that I, but I had had the Neiman Fellowship, so that mm -hmm. he felt that was adequate. Well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, the, let's hear from some of your students. We have some video tributes. Oh, wow. So, uh, oh, positive. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, at least for now. The ones who lasted, 
the ones who stayed in your class are positive about it. The ones who you got to drop out, you know, don't worry okay. about it. You won't hear from them tonight. <laughs> so let's listen to the first couple of uh, tributes oh. here to Mel Mencher. Oh, wonderful. Hi, this is Barbara Gutierrez, class of 80. Melvin Mentor was my wor worst professor and best professor. Worst because he would scream at me sometimes, but he made me a wonderful journalist because of that. He would always say, Gutierrez, the lead is not what you're typing on that first paragraph. And to this day, I remember that. So he's the best because he taught me how to be a journalist and how to question and how to always climb the stairs. So for that, dear, dear professor, I thank you every day of my life. Little did I know it in 1972, when I walked into Mel Mencher's classroom, that my life would be changed forever. There are so many lessons that I learned from Mel then and over the years, but let me mention just one. Go there. Mel had a list of places that students had to go in order to graduate his class. You had to go to a police precinct, a firehouse, a hospital, a welfare office, and of course, the racetrack. Don't wait to learn that on the job. Go there now. And I did. When I got my job at the New York Times a few years later, I was prepared. I had been to all these places and I was ready to cover them. 20 years later, when I left the Times and came to teach at Columbia Journalism, I demanded the same of my students, go, go there. Of course, I added, you had to go to a house of worship. That was something that was not on Mel's list. Mel didn't know it, but he was my guardian angel. I took his lessons a step further a few years into my teaching when I raised money from the Scripps Howard Foundation and I sent my students around the world, go there. They went to Ireland, to Israel, to Russia, to India, to Italy, and it all started in Mel's classroom. Thank you, Mel, for launching me as a journalist, as a reporter, and as a professor. I owe you so much. And here's some more comments. Oh my God. <laughs> Great. Here's some more comments. Uh, Jen Wong from the class of 81. If your uh, good quotes up high, if your mother says she loves you, get a second source. That informed her newspaper and career, and she passed that on to her J students during a decade teaching in oh, Atlanta, in Canada. Uh, and Bill Kurtz, oh, Bill Kurtz. He says that Penn Kimball introduced yeah. you, and he. Uh, graduated before you came there, then he met you in 74, um, and uh, you spoke at uh, Northwestern, uh, Northeastern a oh, couple yes. of times, oh. and you were terrific. How about that? Kelly Smith-Tunney, oh. who was a student of yours at the University of Kansas. Mel Mencher is without doubt the best teacher, professor, and inspirational motivator I had in a journalism classroom in more than 40 years. He did it by standing on our necks, <laughs> always demanding better and yet never giving up on our potential or his. And Fritz McAdden, uh, hearing the horror stories that came out of his classes, you get the impression that this Rasputin lookalike, I don't know about that, uh, was crazy as hell. Mencher, of course, was totally sane, but he was dealing with students who were whip smart and self-assured. And in Mentor's classes, we found out fast how much we didn't know about reporting and writing. Put us through paces like a Marine Corps drill instructor with a platoon of jarhead <laughs> recruits. When it's time to write, be ruthless with yourself. Hone, hone, hone. Tighten, tighten, tighten. Don't settle for a word that's almost right. Be damn sure to make deadlines. And if along the way, Mentor had to whittle down an ego or two to get the point across, he didn't hesitate. <laughs> it reminded me of the old saw about the farmer and the stubborn mule. You know about that one. Um, so it wasn't fun, but it sure made us better journalists and better teachers of the people we hired. How about that? So this is, by the way, folks, how you get a copy of the book. And let me suggest to you that you snap a photo of this with your uh um, with your phones, your smartphones, so that you can have this written down. You, of course, can use the QR code here. Uh, just take a picture of, of that or else use your QR reader. Or, of course, you can uh, follow this web address, digimentors.link slash Mel Mentor Memoir. And so, it's complimentary. Ah. Free. Really? Yes. Yeah, so. Well, this is uh, not a winning proposition uh, financially, Mel. <laughs> no. I don't know about well, that. No, this I, is why you win I'm in journalism instead of banking. Yeah. 
the that's days of <clears throat> writing for money are long gone. Yeah, I guess that's right. But that's really terrific to have those tributes from your students, many of whom became professors. Ari Goldman had a distinguished career at the Times. Barbara Gutierrez became the managing editor of El Nuevo Herald in Miami, and both became uh, journalism professors following in your footsteps. So, Well, you know, <clears throat> I have often thought of journalism, the practice of journalism, as trying to in my case, pass on what was passed on to me by uh, my great mentor, Ralph Blagden, who came out of the <clears throat> St. Louis newspaper, actually the war between the Star Times and the Post-Dispatch. And Ralph taught me after I had been in the business three or four years, how to dig how to get the story underneath the facade. And I like to think that I'm a descendant of, of the great St. Louis tradition of uh, journalism, uh, pull, the Pulitzer tradition. In fact, the Columbia School of Journalism was once called the Pulitzer School because he endowed it. And you know, they've renamed the building. It's now called Pulitzer Hall. Oh, really? Yeah. Isn't that so? Well, and that, yeah, well, I hope the students know the trajectory of the name Pulitzer. It was investigative digging journalism yes. that made the Pulitzer name famous. Absolutely. And that is what you brought to your newspaper work in, uh, in New Mexico. Uh, after uh, you and Helen married, you... Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. You were working covering the state legislature there. Oh, here's a photo of uh, you and Helen with that 39 famous, Chrysler. Uh, the wow. famous Don't car. Don't you wish you still had that car? That <laughs> car broke down on every long trip I took. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Those enough. days, one of the cylinders, well, I think, would cost 40 bucks to fix. Oh, oh what a horror. Well, but it then, looks great. It looked great, though. Looked good. The top had to be replaced every six months or so. <laughs> I remember going one day from somewhere like Roswell down to Carlsbad in New Mexico, and a heavy wind came up and the top blew off. Oh. <laughs> wow. So here's the thing. You were covering the legislature for UPI. Um, UP. No, oh, UP. That's right. There was no... INS was a different thing in those days. Yeah, yes, right. Absolutely. It's a there. long story. Oh, boy. <laughs> so um, you were doing this, and at the same time, you had a column under a pseudonym, R.C. Chambers. R.L. R.L. Oh, see? Sorry to edit your Check it out. No, no, it's all. <laughs> no, I, I needed a pseudonym. I needed a, a, a name because it was against the rules of the United Press. To write for, uh, if you want to, if you were employed by the United Press, you couldn't write for anyone else. That was a fireable offense. And I, the standard, the guild scale wage was a dollar an hour, which was $40 a week. And I worked all of Saturday for time and a half for $12. So on $52 a week, I was raising a family. I couldn't do it, so I had to freelance. And I needed a pseudonym to mislead the UP. And so I adopted, I had a, an admirable instructor at the University of Colorado named Ralph L. Crossman. So I took his initials and I shortened Chamberlain to Chambers, and I mean, Helen's maiden name. Ah. So I became R.L. Chambers and I sold. I have a book here, if I can. I freelanced all over the, wherever I could find a, a, someone willing to pay me for a, a dateline from New Mexico. And here's my little. No kidding. Yeah, from the 1949 earnings, $980.91. Let me just hold this up to the camera to see this. Yeah. This is the, uh, These so are you the, can see the, where do we go here. Yeah. yeah $3 here, that? $4 there. Christian Science Monitor, 
paid 50 cents an inch. I was very fortunate in getting. Uh, yeah. Isn't so that, that something? That's the way you live. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> that's great. That was the way to get by. But eventually, UPI found out about it and uh, asked you to. Uh, oh, go, oh, UP, uh, yeah, sorry. The UP. Uh, to, to take off. <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a very uh, sort of a nasty operator, entrepreneur uh, in journalism. Uh, for reasons I don't know, told the UP that this was R.L. Chambers was Mel Mancher. And, and I was for, I, I've always been, since growing up in the, the time of the New Deal, I was inured as a union member of the union as soon as I could. And the newspaper guild, when I was fired, there was a rule that the UP wouldn't give you a uh, termination uh, fee if there was some cloud. And I said, hell, I need some money. Yeah. Desk. And I'll never forget the newspaper guild fought to get me $200. And that was what that tied, in tied you over. Yeah. yeah. And so then you went to work uh, uh, for a politician, Ed uh, Meacham, a conservative Republican who considered you uh, I wrote this down from your book. He thought you were an atheistic communist. Why <laughs> uh, he ever, I never understood that. <laughs> Ed was a lumbering, um, decent uh, former FBI agent. He told me that his <clears throat> assignment during World War II was to track Paulette Goddard. Paulette Goddard at the time was married to Charlie Chaplin. Uh -huh. For reasons I cannot recall, Charlie Chaplin was supposed to be subversive. And the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover did some incredibly strange things, mm -hmm. like making Ed track Paulette Goddard. That was his great mm -hmm. assignment. And he told me that one day he had to hide under a piano. Well, he, uh -huh. anyway. So That's, what did you learn from that campaign experience, you think, that helped or hindered? What was the impact of that on your journalism and your teaching journalists about politics later? Well, <clears throat> truth. Truth will carry the day. If you tell truths, and this may, in today's world, be... Uh, idealistic beyond rational thought. But at any rate, I told the truth. Uh, Miles, Johnny Miles was part of a very corrupt administration that I covered when I was a, a reporter in Santa Fe covering the State House. And I, I just dug into the files and got some remarkable stories like the, the I don't know whether it's worth recalling the Alcan Highway scandal in which one of the big Democratic finance financiers bought up a whole batch of Alcan oil drums and sold it to the state as lubricating oil. Oh. And they put it in some of these big earth movers and wrecked the engines. <laughs> So uh, at any rate, that's how things worked. Yeah. And it was uh, corrupt. And Meacham, who had no chance because it was a democratic state, won. Amazing. Yeah. He, as I say somewhere, the headline in the Santa Fe paper was Cinderella Man <laughs> Meacham wins. Huh. And... Uh, so after he won, though, you did go back for for uh, to report for the uh, other. Uh, for the, of Alba. I was the Santa Fe State House correspondent for the Albuquerque Journal, a paper mired in mediocrity. But what can you do? <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> I like New Mexico, and Helen loved it, and the kids had. We uh, spent some time living on a ranch, and the kids would run around and naked and swim in the irrigation ditches. It was an idyllic life for kids. Not, yeah. And, and uh, I had a lot of fun. New Mexico was raw. 
I tell the story somewhere about uh, Diamond Tooth Dean Miller, a state senator from, I think, Lincoln County down south, had a diamond embedded in his front, one of his front teeth. And he had a business card, Diamond Tooth Dean Miller, the best senator money can buy. Oh. It was so overt. <laughs> it's very impressive. So, so what about uh, Report on Attic Field Day? I, I imagine so, but if you're working for a paper that was unenergetic. Uh, so you, you heard about this Neiman Fellowship notion, and along came the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard. You barely met the required experience threshold. At 25, you were and seem still to have been the youngest ever Neiman Fellow. Why do you think they accepted you? I think... When I went to Chicago to be interviewed, there's a several stages of the process. <clears throat> and uh, the penultimate stage, or maybe the ultimate stage, is to be interviewed by journalists and the then curator, Louis Lyon, Lyons, in Chicago, because that was a midpoint for people to go, the candidates for this fellowship. And I think they were enthralled by the raw politics and the stories I told and some of the pieces I wrote. For example, the southern part of New Mexico and the eastern part were hardly influenced by migrants from Texas who brought with them racism. So then in Carlsbad, which people know from the Carlsbad Caverns, and in Roswell and Lovington and Hobbs along the east side, oil country, the schools were segregated. It was all kind. It was just the South. Mm. And I had written about that in a long article I wrote for a uh, magazine uh, called Crisis. I think it was published by the NAACP. Right. And uh, I think they were absolutely. Uh, they couldn't believe in that these things were going on and that I could write about them under pseudonyms, of course. And uh, Did I, the newspaper not allow freelancing also or uh, the same kind of I idea? was very, I have to thank the Christian Science Monitor for printing, running a lot of my stories at that time. Yeah. And uh, hmm. I can tell you a story about <laughs> later, much later, I'm teaching at the University of Kansas, and uh, I was hired to advise the students who put out a daily newspaper, the University Daily Kansas. My predecessor, I was told, was a great, great journalist and teacher. And I looked at the papers from that period, and I thought they were, well, I call he said, she said journalism, just routine baloney no digging, and I made my students dig. And in digging, they got a reputation of being a spokesman for the students. And one day, a young man came into the office, a dark-skinned young man, and he said, I want to speak to a reporter. And I said, Linda, uh, Linda Swanson was her name. He, wa he has a story. And he was from someplace in India. He had gone to the housing office. This was early in this term, looking for a place to rent. And they gave him a list. And he said, look at this list. And Linda came to me and said, this is all from the black, it's black section. Lawrence was segregated, had a black section where black people live. And I said, oh, I, I mean, I can't believe it. This is a university town <laughs> practicing. The housing office is practicing what I call later institutional racism. Well, we took off from there and all hell broke loose. Yeah. 
actually, I want to talk about some of those stories for a minute. Uh, but actually, let's take a break and listen to a couple more tributes from the uh, uh, from some more of your students. Let's see what else they yeah. had to say here first. It's embarrassing. Greetings, Mel, from Ralph Blumenthal, class of 1964. You left a mighty impression on us, Mel, which is why we called you Mighty Mel. You also put the fear of God or Mel into us. I will always remember big art is good art. Thanks for everything and best to you. Hi, Mel. It's Lena Sun, class of 1980. Congrats on the book and for guiding so many of us through RW1. The sayings from your little book still resonate with me, even as I still work now covering the pandemic. Thanks to you, some of my deepest and closest friends are from other RW1 classes, ours and the ones before and after. I'm delighted to celebrate this latest milestone with you and your family. So cheers to that, or as we say, gambe. <laughs> That's one. Oh, Mary Dubell. How great is that? And here's Mary Gordon Duville, who says, uh, uh, a top prof who encourages us to do our best with humor, a good dose of reality, and high expectations. Uh, and uh, a garbage man lurched at Miss Gordon Mill sneered, oh my, reporters have got to be tough. Lesson learned. How about that? Um, and Wayne Dawkins, uh, also from my class, re has a recounting a story. Who was He was not one of your students, but his RW1 professor was away, so they sat in on the mentor class and did a timed writing exercise. It was terrifying and funny. Faster, 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 shouted Mentor. <laughs> we hammered the keys of those manual typewriters. The challenge made us stronger. For heaven's How sake. about that? Michael Precker from the class of 77. I did a lot of things I'm proud of in a satisfying career, but the top of the list might be coming up with the sayings of Chairman Mel to celebrate surviving the <laughs> fall semester. Mazel tov on the book. How about that? Michael. And Karen oh. Rothmeyer, who was your adjunct when I was your student, said, we may have been colleagues rather than teacher and student, but I was constantly learning from you. One example was when we put out a Bronx Beat special after the 1980 election. I'd organized a student-administered exit poll that indicated Reagan might win. Even after years of covering elections, you were still interested in the data. And I've often thought over the years how the most important mark of good journalist is the ability to always see things with fresh eyes. Thanks for that and for so much else, including the frying pan <laughs> you and Helen gave us as a wedding present. How about that? Still intact after 40 plus years. That's terrific. Bart Jensen, oh, the class of 89. Chairman Mel's memoir added memories to the voice that has been familiar in my ears for more than 30 years spurred us across New York's boroughs on the poverty beat, pursuing the devil landlord Adonis Morphis, uh, sorry, Morphesis in Harlem, exploring a literacy program with eager adults in Jamaica and covering the sad court cases at Gibraltar in the Bronx. The J School book uh, looks a bit different, but I still apply the lessons from those writing and investigative courses decades later. I can still hear you asking whether another bit of information would help flesh out a story or whether fewer words might move it along better. Uh, you're embarrassed now. How would you feel if it were the front page of the New York Times? Congratulations on the book, Chairman Mill. A little longer than the little red book, but thoroughly enjoyable. Oh, right. Elizabeth Hayes, Elizabeth also Hayes. 89. A huge debt to Mel Mencher. Um, and uh, I was trying to decide which section to sign up for, feeling unsure. Uh, whatever else she told me about Mel, she said that he wore a cape to the opera. Is that true? This may or may not have been true, but I was intrigued enough to sign up for his section. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. I learned say. so much that fall. Uh, it didn't hurt that Mel also shared my love of cribbage. And then second semester, she took investigative reporting, also with Mel, which was eye-opening and useful. Um, considered, uh, urge you to apply to newspapers in the South, which uh, happened. And more than 30 years later, she is still a reporter and has never looked back except with gratitude. So thank you, Mel. I can't wait to read your memoir. Here again is how you get that. Take a picture of that with your, uh, with your smartphone. And keep that address in mind, digimentors.link slash memoir. I should mention, people are talking about the sayings of Chairman Mel. Of course, you mimeographed and passed out some of the sayings that we actually had, but this became a monograph, folks. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, the Pointer Institute actually published this, um, thanks to the encouragement of uh, Chip Scanlon, your former student, um, also known... Uh, pithy sayings. Uh, yes, pithy sayings. And some of these are just absolutely terrific. You know, I mean... Follow the buck, of course. Don't miss a deadline. Be counterphobic. Be a self-starter. Devise your story ideas. Here's one. Work seven days a week, 18 hours a day. That's great. <laughs> um, and this is terrific. If they like you, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, we actually use one of your sayings uh, all the time, uh, which is we in my newsroom, actually at home, my wife has picked this up. Um, you said, uh, getting the facts right is the basic hack minimum. Uh, it's from there that journalism begins. Yeah. Uh, and that phrase, basic hack minimum, has always rung in my ears because so many reporters think they deserve a medal for getting the facts right. Yeah, oh. that's just the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I was very lucky that I had a, at a point in my career, I had a mentor. Uh, Ralph Blagden, to whom I owe a great deal, whom, as I've said, was trained in the St. Louis tradition of in digging and exposing rights or, or wrongs and endorsing rights. And that's the job of the journalist. It has, it has from the time this country had its first newspapers, it was to show the reality of life what's there behind the curtain. And that's what, of course, all the great writers that we admire, Tolstoy and Turgenev and so on, have tried to do in their fiction to show us truths that we skirt. The truth, some, what is it to say? The truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Not bromides. <laughs> well, I don't know. You you just uh, slipped from Tolstoy to oh, my scripture goodness. there. That's very good. There now, we... there, you see, is something. Because we had, uh, you did all this remarkable reporting by your students at Kansas and then packed up the Chevy because you got this offer uh, from Columbia. Because your students had done such great reporting at the University of Kansas, they got a big award which brought you to New York City where people at Columbia were interested in hiring you. Uh, was anybody at Columbia, when you arrived here in 1962, fresh off the Chevy, was anybody teaching the kind of journalism that you were practicing there? I don't think so. I think uh, the great Columbia School of Journalism in my time lived through periods in which there was an eminence. John Hohenberg was the great eminence. And he came from a, a school of a practice, practice of journalism in which you wrote fast and got the story first. There were seven dailies in New York when he was, a, he worked for the Hearst paper, uh, Journal American. And so it was, the, the, the school was oriented toward quick, facile, but that I, I thought facile journalism. There was not much in the way of digging. I instituted a, a course called investigative reporting. And um, my great colleagues, who we were a three-member minority, I think there were uh, eight or 11 of us, I forget, always outvoted, but were Penn Kimball and Larry Pinkham. And Penn knew good journalism, and Larry was a, was a fighter, a tough in in fighter and we tried and we eventually i think won uh not without great cost to to me but that's a, one in the sense of turning the curriculum more in that direction you think i think that the students reacted so positively mm -hmm. that i mean it was it was it's no fun just to re get a handout and rewrite it what the heck who, where's the sport? And I've always thought of journalism as a great sport. It was fun, fun to do these things, fun to get at the truth, fun to take the politician who is all facade, all words, no deed, and to, to puncture it. Sorry, it's just sort of ruthless. But uh, I forget who said some... So when I wish I could remember it, she said, journalism is ruthless. Uh -huh. it, it has to be. It has to tell truths. Not very many people want, people want idols. People want a, a, a Donald Trump, a facade, nothing there, but they love it. And your job is to punch holes. Look, here's the real Trump. Here's the real governor. Here's the real senator. 
That's the job of the journalist. And it's not a popular position to be in. And you also, though, brought into investigative reporting uh, not just the deep search in documents and statistics. And I remember you giving us a lecture on a mathematics lecture, basically, <laughs> uh, uh, with a with a graph showing uh, the the uh, you know the outlying points and explaining outlying. But you also had us do the the live in. What's the theory behind the live in? Well, at Columbia. We had, uh, it's expensive. I hate to tell you what the tuition is today, 70 or $80,000. But for, in those days, and so we got, uh, we had, although we did have a good uh, uh, grant program, but we had mostly upper middle and upper class students, the children of well-to-do families. Um, and I felt that they should, and New York was a great melting pot. You could find everything here in the way of, of economic strata. And I thought students should be uh, acquainted with people and causes and ideas that would alien to them in their upbringing and their schooling. So I sent them to some pretty awful places. Well, I don't know if you can, can you look at this screen there? You just missed a, a, a statement by Tim Weiner, who is just, uh, the student people are actually writing and doing social media here. Here's one. Part of Mill's oh, genius is that he is both moral and ethical. How about that? Radical. Radical. Sorry. <laughs> moral and Oh, radical. yes. Well, I've always been thought of as sort of, I've, I reached the point, someone said I was, told Dean Barrett, why did you hire this communist? Finally, I wrote the FBI, and I, unfortunately, I didn't bring it with me to this setting. I said, please send me my FBI file. Because in New Mexico, I knew uh, several, New Mex in Santa Fe, it had a significant group of very well-to-do very left-wing people. In fact, the first person I met in Santa Fe when I was looking for a place for Helen and me to live was a woman lawyer from the Lawyers Guild of the 30s. The Lawyers Guild was a communist front that defended the Scottsboro Boys. I don't know how many of your viewers, listeners, have ever heard of the Scottsboro Boys. They were a group of black young men uh, hoboing on a, on a train um, who a bunch of girls accused of rape. And they were railroaded. Mm -hmm. They hadn't raped the women at all. And this woman whom I was seeking to rent one of her little cottages, Annie Webster, defended the Scots. I mean, the history is so remarkable. Here in New Mexico, I'm meeting a woman, part of history, older woman, defending the Scots, Annie Webster. Hmm. And she was, she was so thrilled to have someone talk to her about this part of history. So we finally got a little place to rent. And I thought that uh, throughout life, People are really interested in knowing what happened then. Why did we get to this point? What happened then? And it's hard to try, try to teach youngsters who are all au courant. They're all today, all now. That they're the product of things that have occurred a generation or two ago. You know, as you think about how you created things, I have to bring up Owl's Head because uh, this is this uh, remote island uh, in the, on the French River in Ontario that you and your family uh, went to is, every yeah. summer. Uh, Remarkable. And, and I think you actually wrote uh, a lot of the textbook in the study. That literally there. Is looking out on the yeah. river. Can anything be more inspiring than to look out on a, on a, on a beautiful waterscape and sit there and peck away 
at a typewriter and listen to classical music. Yeah. Uh, well. So, to, how did that affect uh, your your work? I would think that having that freedom from the city a little bit uh, would give you the the kind of time that you would need to be able to produce this textbook. Uh, well, it was it was like a decompression chamber yeah. because when we first went up, we had no electricity. We had and we used an outhouse for plumbing which is, I won't go into details, but anyone who's ever lived on a farm with an outhouse knows that it's not easy to cope. Anyway, uh, it, was, it was liberating. And I think I did some of my best writing. There they are, the kids in front of the cottage and Helen. Uh, it was hard for the kids, no TV, uh -huh. We didn't have it. We had radios, which we could hear at night, especially we could get the clear channel stations like CBS from New York, <clears throat> which Tom and I heard the Stanley Cup final when the Rangers won. And I can't remember how many years ago that was. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, it was not easy. And the kids had, I thought it was tough hard for them to go from New York to a place remote. <laughs> the neighbor was a few miles away and uh, uh, we had to go in every seven or 10 days to get provisions. And you had, at the beginning, you had no, you had to get ice for an, for an ice box. Gradually we became propane <laughs> adherents we got a propane fridge so we didn't have to we'd get a block of ice in the early days like this and by the time we got up to the cottage it had melted to this already uh, huh. but it was good for for all of us to uh be in that sort of raw environment and the neighbors <clears throat> it was it, it was good for the kids because we relied on each other up there <clears throat> and neighbors were very important. And that's, in a city like New York, I don't know the people who are living next door. Uh -huh. I don't know them. I see a woman coming in and out and some guy who's supposed to be a physicist, I just say, but I don't know them. Up there, you know them because you need them and they need you. And one year when we ran out of <coughs> We had a wood stove and it, the nights are cold and we ran out of wood and our neighbor uh, down the uh, river, he loved to cut wood. And that's how we got our wood. We cut down trees with a chainsaw and saw them up into pieces and he tidied me through with some wood. Uh -huh. So that was instructive. Well, and it enforced some, it, it actually, sort of enforced adventure on your family that you had achieved by taking off for New Mexico. Basically, you hit the frontier. Yeah. Uh, so Do you kind things. of it to them. Be counterphobic. Be counterphobic. There you go. <laughs> you know, I've got to ask you, we're, we're already nearing the end of the time that, we, that, that people have allotted for it. So, But I have to ask you about the current situation because it seems to me that this is so... Uh, we live in a time when journalism is confronting the challenge that you spoke of often in class, uh, going back to that notion of getting the facts straight being the basic hack minimum. Um, these days, there's a lot of talk about the sort of um, the peril of both sideism in the press uh, in covering um, a, a, an entire political party that seems to have abandoned uh, reliance upon fact. Well, I've lived through a period in journalism <clears throat> where if you knew someone was talking gibberish, you cleaned up so that it made your story made sense. <clears throat> when Goldwater was running for the presidency, this was a great breaking point. The reporters had a hell of a time. He talked, he was incoherent, he talked nonsense. It's not that he was right wing or reactionary. They just couldn't make sense, but it was their job to have a coherent story. 
and they made him into coherence. Today, you see in the, in the I read the Times, and so I'm biased, of course, in my observation. But if someone doesn't make sense, the reporter says, I didn't agree with something, so and so. And, and you have columnists saying this is a lie. I mean, it's our, we've come that far to tell truths about what's happening. In my day, you couldn't do this. Do you think it's good? How do you feel about this change? Well, I mean, it puts, and that's why a lot of can, conservatives hate journalists because they try to tell the truth that this is a facade, that this didn't work when it was tried. <clears throat> it's, um, what's really worrisome though, is the disappearance of the daily newspaper, which used to, the reporters used to go down to the city hall and look at how there was an imbalance in the, in the state, in the city tax system where certain people or groups were favored and the homeowner was stuck. And this digging, this newspaper doesn't exist anymore. I heard something like 100, 4,000 newspapers have folded. Mm -hmm. There's a promising, <laughs> it's hard to believe, but high school and college journalists in a lot of these communities are doing this. And I go, it takes me back to my days in Kansas when I, we put out the daily cans and, and on big events like the like the presidential election, we printed a huge number and distributed it downtown. The local paper was, I don't want to go into it. it it's sad. I wrote a piece for the Monitor about bias and the history of the University of Kansas and his uh, institutional racism. And the editor of the local paper wrote a response saying, ah. it's all baloney, it's all a lie. Right. How do you cope with that? Mm -hmm. It's the, well, truth tellers were never honored. They were always reviled. Well, that's one of the reasons we're here tonight. Oh, uh, well, to I appreciate your teller. coming. Listen, uh, let's have a couple more uh, tributes from uh, some folks here. Let's hear what other students uh, have to say. Wonderful to have you here, Rex, because you're part of that generation of truth tellers that I hoped I had inspired. <laughs> and Congratulations, Professor Mencher, on an outstanding book. I devoured every single page. Uh, just beautifully written and really touching. I mean, the scenes with your, you and your sister and the struggles you had growing up, the issues with your father, um, those love letters to Helen. I mean, all it really shows the soft side. In some ways, I wish I would have known this before I had you as a professor. But um, then again, I think if students would have known your soft side, they might not have been sufficiently scared of you and they might not have worked as hard as they did. So anyway, what a gift to your students and your family and the entire journalism community. Thank you so much for doing that. We just, it's, you continue to inspire. My copy of The Thoughts of Chairman Mel moved with me to every job. RW1 changed my life and gave me lifelong friends. Now my Chairman Mel booklet has a companion, a hardbound companion, your memoir. I will cherish the book as I cherish you. Congrats, Mel. <laughs> oh my, for heaven's sake, where'd you get Paul? <laughs> he He's somewhere he in Asia. Your, your career to you um, because of the serious business of journalism. <laughs> get this, a cross between James Cagney and Muhammad Ali uh, with usually Schubert or Beethoven playing in the background in your office. That's so great. And a sofa where students could collapse. Uh, I still have a copy of the sayings of Chairman Mill and have used that along with your book when I was teaching budding journalists in Asia. For heaven's sake. Donna Hanover, 
you know who she was. Yes. I remember transferring into your class because you had a fantastic reputation. I want to learn as much as possible during my year at the J school. Let's just say it was harder than I thought it would be. You gave her a great foundation for anchoring jobs. And she's been a correspondent for the last 10 years at CUNY TV on Arts in the City and Simply Science. Thank you for being a terrific teacher, says Donna Hanover. Uh-huh. And here's Chip Scanlon. Uh, with just a year's of experience at a small, a year's experience at a small daily, I knew I had nine months to achieve my goal to learn how to be a journalist. I asked the dean of students who was the toughest teacher, Professor Mencher. He said without hesitation, and he was right. It would take me decades to master my craft as an investigative journalist, but from Mel, I learned the role of a journalist in a democracy and the importance of holding institutions accountable and standing up for those affected by their decisions. He sent us out into the world armed with a steadfast attachment to those values, especially through his eye-opening live-in assignments. Like so many others, I owe my career to Professor Mencher. Thanks for everything you gave, and congratulations on your fascinating memoir. It was wonderful to join you on your lifelong journey as husband, father, journalist, teacher, writer, and mentor. What a remarkable achievement. Wow. (laughs) How about that? That's remarkable. Thanks for the encouraging me to start my journalism career outside the New York City area. As a native New Yorker, it may have been easier to begin in Buffalo or perhaps New Haven instead of Denver and Houston with their conservative right-wing values. But I gained a bit of a bird's eye view and sometimes painful lesson about this country of ours upfront and personal. And Lena Sun, who you saw earlier, that RW1 class you taught decades ago is still one of the most memorable and gratifying periods of my life. Also, you have no idea how much we talked about you. <laughs> I was in those conversations. I have the MM reporting primer on my bookshelf. Thrilled to have a memoir. So grateful for everything you have done for us. She was remarkable. And here's Barbara. I will oh, love you Barbara. and respect you always. You made me a journalist. Well, I think many of us could say uh, something similar to that, and uh, we are grateful for it. Um, oh. I think that uh, we... Uh, I encourage people. Uh, we'll have up on the screen again how to actually order the book. Um, well, I'll just write, and I'll, it'll. It's no at no cost. I'll even pay the postage. <laughs> well, that I doesn't seem think. right. But anyway, it's a, it's really fascinating. You know, uh, here's the way to get it. Again, you got the QR code there, or there's the link uh, through Digimentor. Uh, Digimentors that link slash Mel Mencher memoir. Well, thank you, Max. Well, absolutely. You know, um, I should just make a note here, folks, of a couple of of people who made a difference here, especially uh, Mel's son, Nick, who lives here in Riverside Drive uh, and has been the stalwart in this effort, Uh, son Tom and daughter Mariana. uh, Former uh, Mencher adjunct uh, Karen Rothmeyer became a professor at the journalism school and Marianne Giordano. Um, uh, Marianne was a mentor student in the class of 79, I believe. Wow. Uh, the J School's alumni director, by the way, Anusha Shrivastava, who uh, helped spread the word. You don't know Anusha, but she has uh, really helped to get the word out really? and has uh, drawn some of the hundreds of people who are listening tonight. Um, so, and from Digimentors, the crew uh, led by uh, CEO Sri Srinivasan and the guy who has really made all this happen, Neil Parekh. And um, uh, of course, our leader who conceived this event and pushed it until it really happened in her charming and irrepressible way. Meryl Ray for heaven's sake. How about that? Meryl, yeah, look at that. Meryl Perlman. It's amazing how many nexuses there are. Um, all pointing to Mel. Uh, but most of all, Mel, thanks to you, our teacher and guide, our inspiration. Uh, and I'm glad so many of us finally got a chance to say uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> So, you know, for those of you who are out here uh, could come on in if you like, and we'll fit a few more people in the living room so people can see that there are people here. Here comes Renee. Here's Marianne. Uh, uh, and uh, that is Marianna and Marianne. Here's Tom. Neil had to leave town today. Here, here we go. Here's Marianne. Uh, Shri is here. Um, we can't get him into the picture. Okay. So, uh, and to those of you out there, thank you so much for uh, joining us as we're, there we go, there's Shri. Well, thank uh, you for coming. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Mel. Mel. Yeah. For all you taught us. I used to think I was a has-been or a was. Now I think <laughs> I am an am. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. How great thank is you. that? Thank you all. <laughs> thank there's you. more to come. Keep watching. There's some more pictures. <laughs> Hi, Melvin. This is Frank Roberts, brother of Eric Roberts. And uh, I, I 
may be the only person that read your book in one sitting. Um, and uh, I thought it was great, but what I was struck with more than anything else was what a gift it is to your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren um, to be able to live those events for you. Um, I thought it was fantastic. I love that you did it. I loved everything about it. Uh, congratulations. Hey Mel, it's Bill Lichtenstein, class of 79. want to add to the tributes that you're receiving today. You know, I, I looked up on your bio and I saw the year 1989. And I first thought that was when you joined the journalism school. That's when you retired. <laughs> you have been around a long time, Mel. And I just, you know, to, to show your continued relevance, I just want to point out something here on my books. I hope you can see this. What do I have here? A copy of news reporting and writing. And of course, if you open the page 488, you see probably the most famous part of the book and most important, follow the buck, right? Well, listen, good luck. It's great being a part of this uh, tribute and um, hope to see you sometime soon. Bye. Hi, Grandpa. It's <laughs> it's me, Catherine, Eric, and your wonderful great-grandchildren who love you so much, Callie and Levi. We just really want to appreciate the time that you took to write your memoir. <laughs> we're so grateful that we have this gift to remember your amazing accomplishments by, and we're also so, so, so grateful that our kids get to meet you and spend time with you. We love you very much. Thanks. And we can't wait for our kids to read this book when they're old enough so they can <laughs> learn about your amazing life and career. Thanks, Grandpa. Hey, Grandpa, congratulations on the book. I really enjoyed reading it and learning more about your wildlife and journalism and how it eventually led to me. Um, I always have fond memories growing up of just being totally captured by the covers of the um, textbook and loving to uh, thumb through them and even had the honor of being on the cover uh, myself as some of our attendees might recognize. Um, but anyway, congratulations. Um, very happy for you and excited for many more years. Thanks. Mel, I'm proud to be a Mentorite. Thank you for being tough on me. You and Karen Rothmeyer were a terrific combination. I made it through because of your kind words beneath your tough surface and uh, my classmates like Mr. Smith, Miss Newman, Miss Franklin, Miss Gutierrez, um, Mr. Bronner, and uh, Miss Scott, and Miss Sun, and we adore you and thank you for all you taught us. Onward, Renee Edelman. Hello, Professor Sandy and Jerry here. We wanted to send greetings from Hawaii. We can't wait to get the book, uh, but Nick has sent ahead some mentor codes. So we're waiting for the rest of your wit and wisdom. Wait, wait. Does this sign even in AP style? What do you mean? Well, is it professor before a name, lowercase? Once a journalism professor, always a journalism professor. Aloha. Aloha.